Welcome to the Storm Surf Video Surf Forecast for the week starting Sunday, May 22nd. Looking at significant wave heights for the South Pacific Ocean, we see an area of low pressure here that has created some seas, but most of them are aimed south at Antarctica. Another little area of low pressure has also generated seas earlier, pushing towards Southern California, but from a very south angle. And other than that, another area of low pressure trying to organize in the central South Pacific, but not doing a whole lot yet. Let's get into the details. First up, we'll take a look at jet stream level winds. These winds up about 30,000 feet help support the formation of gales, and when they do form, help direct their track. We're looking for a trough. That is a dip, or in this case, sort of a push to the north in the jet stream in the southern hemisphere. That would create a clockwise flow aloft and down at the surface, which is the hallmark of low pressure in the southern hemisphere. And of course, low pressure can generate winds. Winds generate seas. Seas, as, the, as, the, as they move away from the fetch area, generate swell, which ultimately results in surf when it hits your beach. So, as expected, upper level trough, low pressure, actually cut off low here, uh, just east of New Zealand, previously was in the Tasman Sea and has generated rather large swell pushing towards Fiji and starting to hit at this moment. But for right now, the, split, the jet is now displaced well to the south, pretty much cutting off all energy from this area. Now we have a bit of a trough trying to organize right here. That would help support low pressure development. And then that's about it. Let's put this into motion, see what happens. As we get into about Monday or Tuesday, notice the trough gets better defined here in the southeast Pacific with 150 plus knot winds pushing up into it, offering some support for gale development. Now that trough is a bit steep, but not cut off even into Wednesday. And then Thursday, it finally cuts off. Notice the flow goes this way underneath the trough, but still some circulation going on. And then that eventually just sort of peters out. And then we have a very split pattern with the northern branch here running around uh, with, uh, 28 degrees south and the southern branch down around 60 south and not doing a whole lot. We'll roll this out again. We're at Friday now and we continue on and then we get into oh, Sunday. And still, it, sort of the jet is trying to push a little bit to the north here, but not enough to really create a trough, and certainly with not enough winds to do anything of interest. Let's go take a look at surface level winds now. And here we are, surface level winds, surface level pressure, uh, pretty much as we surmise by looking just at the significant wave height chart, low pressure here, uh, just east of New Zealand. But again, all the fetch is aimed, if anything, at New Zealand, and certainly not to the north in our direction. Another little area low pressure trying to organize here in the southeast Pacific, and then another cutoff low here that we saw, but nothing producing fetch of interest at the moment. But that quickly changes by this evening and into Monday. Notice an area of 40 to a little tiny area, 45 knot winds pushing due north. So uh, California is right here at about 120. So aimed right at California. Not particularly strong, not particularly large, but fetch is fetch, we'll take it. Now, not really aimed at Hawaii, which is over about 155 west and well north of here. So we'll just roll this out. Fetch continues. Secondary fetch develops on Monday night with a little pocket of 45 knot winds, but mostly just 35, maybe 40 knot winds. Again, pushing well to the north and lifting north too into Tuesday night. And then Wednesday, yet another little patch of fetch develops. Same thing and actually pushing almost northwest Wednesday night. Um, this is sort of an evolving situation. The models have changed. Now, California, remember, about 117 west is where it cuts off. But this fetch is in the swell window. And then it fades out. And we're out. And then we're looking for something new. We see some fetch here into Saturday a week out, but all aim pretty much due to the east. You want something more to the northeast to really produce meaningful swell. And then we roll out 180 hours and things get rather quiet as surmised by looking at the jet stream as well. Let's go take a look at significant wave heights. So here we go. We're actually stepping back in time to Thursday, the 19th of May. Focus right now is here in the Tasman Sea and also a little patch off of Chile here. Put this into motion. Here is this storm we talked about uh, producing, oh, in the low 40-foot seas. What is that? Uh, 40, almost 42-foot seas there on Friday morning. And that was about it. But notice it lifted well to the northeast. 
with uh, Fiji right up in here. A lot of energy pushing that way. Also notice right here, we're going to go back just a little bit, this little tiny fetch right here on Friday. Now, California is over right in here and well to the north, but just enough little fetch here might be able to push sort of a southeast swell into Southern California about a week out, so maybe next weekend. Um, nothing significant. You see there, what's that? 22, 24, 26, 28 foot seas. That's maybe good for a 15 second period swell at its peak. Anyway, so that gets us up to current. Let's go look at the forecast. So here we are. We're going to really focus on this area here because that is the next little gale that's forecast to develop here as we go. 28 foot seas Monday morning. Again, aim pretty well to the north. And then more fetch, a little tiny area, 30 foot seas. But this is just a small, not very consequential system. Secondary fetch starts developing Monday night into Tuesday. A little bit better here. What is that? 20, 22, 24, 26, 27, maybe 28 foot seas. Um, and lifting well to the north, a little patch of 30-foot seas. This is probably where the majority of the swell generation will occur. And then it kind of moves out all barely in the California swell window. But again, here's that other fetch that was almost pushing to the northwest. So all what this means is probably a good run of rather small, very south-angled swell, probably focused best on Southern California. Not big size, not long period, but rideable. And at this point... It, in uh, the season, rideable is all that counts. And then we're moving out into next weekend and things. We see some fetch down here or, or some seas, but nothing of any particular interest. And things get rather quiet again. So basically one gale lasting for three, maybe even four days. Good for some swell, but nothing significant. Let's go take a look at the northern hemisphere. And this will be rather quick. A just look at significant wave heights for the North Pacific Ocean. We'll roll through this. There's just not a whole lot going on. It's one little area fetch here, but it's all aimed to the north. 18-foot seas or so, 19-foot seas. And theoretically, some energy to wrap around the slow and maybe get a little tiny area of 20-foot seas on Wednesday evening. That would be good for maybe some eh, 12 or 13 second period small swell for Hawaii because it's rather far away. And then things die off. Wind swell for California, yes, you can see it on the charts here. Uh, nothing significant, but just something. Wind swell, it's either wind swell in northern and central California this time of year or southern California uh, and, and southern hemi swell for places north, north of there and Hawaii. So for now, the northern Pacific is effectively asleep. Let's go take a look at long-term projections. We now move from an El Nino dominated pattern to the typical backlash La Nina now in control and expected for the next year. Let's get into the details. First off, take a look at winds over the Kelvin wave generation area, really from here, 135 east out to about 170 west right in here. We see trades, east winds, no sign of west winds, clearly no indication of the active phase of the MJO, uh, and, and for that matter, no signs of El, Mi El Nino anymore. Here are wind anomalies for this area, and you see pretty much a neutral pattern, which is actually good. Trades are not stronger than normal, which would suggest La Nina. But you can see here one cool water taking over this area and cooler than normal anomaly-wise, so that suggests the development of La Nina. Looking at the forecast, first we'll take a look at history, though. The uh, Kelvin wave generation area, and this is the main area we want to watch for enhancement of the jet stream, both north and southern hemisphere, about from 135 east to 170. Reds in this uh, um, chart indicate west wind anomalies, and you can see starting in May we don't see any reds, but instead we're seeing blues, which suggest easterly anomalies. And the forecast for the next, next week is continuation of easterly anomalies. Now, this chart is up at the 850 millibar level, up about 4,200, 4,500 feet up. Down at the surface, all our data is suggesting that these east anomalies are not actually manifesting, but it's dead, just dead neutral. And again, that is the forecast for the next week. Let's go see what um, the MJO is doing. Looking at outgoing long wave radiation forecasts for the next two weeks, blues suggest more cloudiness, less 
reflect, uh, sunlight reflectivity off the ocean surface, which means the active phase of the MJO. Here's the Kelvin wave generation area right here. That's where most of your enhancement of the jet stream when the MJ moves over this area. That's what enhances the jet stream. Right now, the oranges suggest the inactive phase of the MJO. And for the next week, that is supposed to fade out per the statistic model. And the active phase is to move into that region. Now, looking at the GEFS, the ensemble GFS model, the dynamic model, it suggests instead that uh, the inactive phase, though very weak, is to hold in the Kelvin wave generation area, and that will hold the active phase off from moving into the West Pacific. So this model suggests no enhancement of the jet stream. Another way to look at this, phase diagram charts. We're looking down on the North Pole. We travel around the globe counterclockwise from the marine continent over or maritime continent over the date line to the west pacific over into california and the u.s west coast across america into the uh, atlantic ocean and africa and then eventually over and back into the indian ocean the the red line suggests where the active phase of the MJO has been. The green line suggests where it's going over the next two weeks. And basically, we have a pretty reasonably strong active phase per this, the ECMF model, in over the maritime continent. So basically over Indonesia, you I've seen some reports of rains, flooding, that sort of thing. This is typical in this region when the active phase is over it. Over the next two weeks, per this model, the active phase of the MJO is to collapse maybe pop out into the West Pacific uh, two weeks out. But the uh, GEFS model suggests, no, just a total collapse of the active phase of the MJO and nothing else coming from it, which suggests the inactive phase is probably going to hang in this region in some fashion. And yet one more model, the CFS model, 850 millibar winds. Again, here is, now this is past history here, last westerly, really solid westerly wind burst in February. It actually created a small Kelvin wave. And then another little mini westerly wind burst in April, but there was no warm water uh, under it to push to the east into uh, like the Galapagos area. So here we are right now, basically a dead neutral wind pattern. And just looking here, you see little portions of maybe weak westerly anomalies, but nothing significant. We overlay the MJO. The dotted line is the inactive phase of the MJO, just as we expected in over the Kelvin wave generation area. A weak active phase is supposed to set up here maybe in the uh, June time frame, early part of June, with weak westerly anomalies, but nothing to, to, to you know really do anything to enhance the jet. And then things just kind of fall apart, and it's very a weak weather pattern, if anything, weak easterly anomalies forecast into August. So uh, no strong signs of the MJO doing anything. Next up, we look at subsurface water temperatures, West Pacific here, East Pacific here, going down in depth, and this is just on the equator, two degrees north and south of the equator. And as expected, with El Nino fading out, all the warm water that was pulled up here is sloshing back to the West Pacific. You can see a building area of warm water here, the 28-degree isotherm, which was the whole way over here into the Galapagos, is slowly retreating. Now it's down back to 152 west and it'll probably collapse a little bit more this is pretty typical as the trades start blowing here it literally so during el nino the trades are suppressed warm water that's in the west pacific sloshes east then when you get into la nina trades are actually enhanced all the warm water that's here starts blowing back to the west and starts building up here. Subsurface wise, here's the anomalies, the differences in normal for this time of year. Now we did see a large warm pocket here and we were watching Kelvin waves, that is balls of warm water or pockets of warm water that were being driven by enhanced westerly anomalies here traveling, going uh, under the equator, and then gurgling up along uh, the Galapagos and creating a warm pool there. That's all completely gone now. Even what was left of the warm pool here from El Nino is all but gone now. We're pretty much in a neutral regime, if anything. Much cooler than normal water, four degree below normal. A river of it is washing its way subsurface to the east and starting to erupt off Ecuador and the Galapagos, and you can see that here. Also down one more chart, the 18th of May, high res, basically the same picture. Lots of cold water, 
No warm water. Here's the last little bit of the El Nino warm pool moving to the west and dissipating rapidly. So let's take a look at surface water temperatures. Actual difference, so this is anomalies. Difference is normal for this time of year. And as expected, cooler water building up along just barely along the coast of Peru and Ecuador here, and then being caught by the trades, blown over the Galapagos, and now well into the central equatorial Pacific, out to a point basically south of Hawaii. What is that, about 155, maybe even more? And these temperatures here are one and a half to almost two degrees cooler than normal here. Classic La Nina signs. The trend for the past seven days, and you can see it here, the blues are where temperatures are getting cooler, and sure enough, right along the coast of Peru, off of Ecuador, and then uh, the Galapagos, and then building out here, cool upwelling, uh, you would say, from easterly trades, but also we saw much cool subsurface water. That's also getting drawn to the surface, making for a cool pool. That is classic La Nina development. Also notice here, cooling trend off of Africa, sort of a mini reflection of what's going here in the uh, Pacific, also in the Atlantic. This is just the trend, not actual water temperatures. Now also notice cooling water start to develop off California here. This is associated with high pressure that's blowing quite firmly in this area and has been now for a week or two. Uh, not unexpected. But also notice this warm stretch here. This is associated with what we think is the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, the movement towards the positive or active phase of the PDO. We'll take a look at the next chart. You can see it better there. And here's again a more drawn out view uh, higher, uh, of the uh, anomalies. Clearly the cool pool showing up here very well, very uh, solid, uh, but still kind of meandering a little bit. Leftover El Nino warm water north and south of it. And also now notice the cool pool, though the trend is cooler here, it's not it's still pretty much normal water temperatures south of Africa here. Now here's the PDO thing we were talking about. Cooler water here, warm water lifting up into um, uh, the Pacific Northwest. If this holds into the fall, this would be a very good sign. Even though La Nina is going on, if the PDO is active, it might suppress the uh, the evolution of La Nina, shorten it, make it not as strong. I mean, we're still in for a year or two of not such good uh, support <laughs> from the tropics here, but still it would help mute it somewhat if the PDO were active. So something to watch for. Next coupling of the atmosphere or El Nino, still the atmosphere thinks that some form of El Nino is in play, and you can tell it by looking at this index here, Southern Oscillation Index, differences in pressure between Darwin, Australia, and Tahiti. Negative numbers on a daily basis suggest the active phase of the MJO, and over a longer period of time suggest the uh, El Nino. Now this hasn't been updated since the 19th, but still at that time we were down at minus 15, minus 13, though we had had a pretty good run here the past month of positive numbers, but it was well negative prior to that in late April. Anyway, the 30-day uh, running average still uh, minus 7.94, suggestive of at least uh, the active phase of the MJO or hangover, really, we should say, of the active phase of the MJO or El Nino. Now, here's the real teller. The 90-day running average still minus 12.21, definitely suggestive of remnants of El Nino. And here's the 30-day running average graphed out. Here was the big change that occurred. Prior to this, we were all in positive numbers. Then about February, March of 2014, big downward negative spike. It tried to recover, and then we were just on a steady downward trend, uh, reflective of the building of El Nino and perhaps the shift of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And then we bottomed out here somewhere around the October time frame, uh, inactive phase of the MJO, active phase, inactive, active. And now here we are in our inactive phase. And we expect at some point these numbers to start creeping up into the zero range and probably going above that. That is classic La Nina symptoms, something to look forward to. And then the uh, uh, ESPI index, rather than uh, using barometric pressure, this uh, calculates total rainfall deviations from normal uh, north of Darwin and then uh, in the area here roughly north of Tahiti. 
Um, positive numbers, the current index value is 0.45. Positive numbers suggest La, uh, El Nino. Negative numbers suggest La Nina. We are slowly coming down. I think we were up at like 2.5 at one point during the peak of early on in uh, El Nino, but now things are slowly returning to normal. You can see precipitation pretty much here. The For whatever reason, the, uh, the um, anomaly chart is not showing. But anyway, a slow decline in the ESPI.